This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. This is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode 280, recorded on January 12th, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello. Good to be with you. (laughs) Trying to decide who to call on first. You usually go west uh, to east. I go west to east or east to west. It doesn't really matter. So joining us from St. Louis, Petra Levin. It's nice to be here. Thank you. And from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone, and welcome to 2023. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year. And what is it you said uh, we did how many episodes last year, Michael? I think 24, 25. Not bad. We're at 280 today. Yes. How many years are we going? This begins uh, year uh, 12, I believe. Wow. Uh, we started in 2000, 2011, yes. So this would be year 12. We started when uh, things were different at ASM. <laughs> yes. We had a different leadership. We had, who was the lady in charge of communications? Barbara Hyde. Barbara Hyde. And Chris Kandayan was working there, the media guy. And he was the one who was really pushing um, this whole electronic format, everything from podcasting, especially for the lay public. Yeah. He really wanted to make microbiology approachable. He was really one of the strong proponents of microbial literacy, that the general public has to have a fair understanding of the microbial world. And as we have witnessed over the last 10 years with the evolution and the revolution in the microbiome, we really now begin to appreciate that you really need to have some microbial knowledge, even as a, you know, garden variety average Joe uh, across our, across the earth. So I had known Chris because uh, he had been helping promote TWIV and TWIP. And he said, well, we should do a TWIM. So I said, okay. And he said, there's this guy, Michael Schmidt, that we should have. I said, okay. (laughs) Yeah, I was I was serving on the communications committee as my term was ending on the Centennial Heritage Committee when ASM turned 100. And um, I had been doing a lot of lay press for ASM, you know, trying to make our science approachable because I too, like Chris, strongly believe in the importance of microbial literacy for uh, the general public. And uh, when he said... It, it should be fun. I, I hey. said, okay. Do you know this Vince Rack and Yellow guy? And I says, I think he's a virologist. Yeah, and I, it was a good. It was a good thing to start, and um, I, I got to know Chris quite well. We over the years we've had hosts come and go. We had Joe Handelsman for a while yeah. on Twim. We had Margaret McFull Nye. Um, of course, Elio Schechter. Elio Schechter, yeah, great addition. Um, we had Stan Malloy. Stan Malloy for a while and some others. We so, tried to have Ron Atlas, but he was reluctant to come on, yeah. even though Ron can talk for days. So I uh, then Chris left ASM a number of years ago. I lost track. And I was in Miami uh, in December. I'm sitting in a diner having lunch, and this guy comes up to me, says, what are you doing here? And I look up and it's Chris. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> he, was, he was working at a photo uh, expo or something down there. He's become a world-renowned street photographer. Good for him. Really, You know, he walks down the street and he takes pictures of people and uh, it makes it look good. Yeah, good for him. He's published a book and uh, he's doing very well. So he works over at the American Psychological Association, I that think. Sounds so, right. That he's sounds he's right. a media person like he did at ASM, but then once he gets off work, he, he does this other stuff, which is great. So it was really good to see him. Okay. So that's TWIM. It's short, a brief history of TWIM. <laughs> and uh, today we will continue in what we have done for many years, give you some science, and we'll start uh, with a snippet from Petra. 
So um, this paper is uh, entitled Magnesium Modulates, I like the alliteration, Bacillus Subtilis Cell Division Frequency. It's by Ting Feng Guo and Jennifer Herman in the biology department, or in the Department of Biochemistry and Biophysics, sorry, at Texas A&M in College Station, Texas. And I picked this paper partly for like selfish reasons. It's about the regulation of cell division, and that's something my lab works on. But also because I think it's a great paper in that it's really open-ended. They see a phenotype, and it's environmentally driven, so it's not you know, a mutation phenotype. It's that the environment impacts how things look, how the cells behave, sort of. And they do some experiments to rule out a lot of things, but it's it's open-ended what's actually going on. And so as I go through this paper, it would be great if our listeners kind of start thinking, like, what are the possibilities that are driving this phenotype? And this was published recently in Journal of Bacteriology, an ASM journal. Exactly. It's an ASM journal, Journal of Bacteriology. And it's, um, yeah, it's so recent that the version I have says month YYY volume XXX issue XX. (laughs) So it doesn't even have like an official number on it. But the other reason I like this paper, and you might notice the theme with papers I've selected, is that it's um, based on closely looking at cells. So essentially, and they start with this. So the the take-home message of this paper in the end is, extracellular magnesium concentration changes the length at which Bacillus subtilis, which is a rod-shaped gram-positive bacterium, monoderm, divides. That's the message of this paper. It's extracellular magnesium, and it alters the length at which these cells divide. But the way it starts is Mm. through just an observation and then some thinking. they are making lysogeny broth, which is sometimes called Luria broth, but is uh, nicknamed LB. And they um, use essentially pre-made powder. So it's Luria broth is tryptone, yeast extract, salts, and that's basically that's it. That's it. Um, and but they use a pre-mixed powder. It's called LB and Lennox powder from Sigma, so a big supplier. They get this powder, and it should be that every batch you get is the same, and the bacteria behave the same or look the same in all of these. And what they noted is in their new batch, so a new batch number of this powder, and again, it only has three things in it, was that they looked at the cells that they grew in it, and the cells were longer than they expected. And so why in this batch of powder is that happening? And at least here, they say they they thought first that it might be a magnesium problem because it turns out that tryptone, which is one of the three major ingredients in LB, uh, is often low in magnesium. And previous studies had shown that low magnesium often leads to filamentation. And filamentation Mm -hmm. just means that the bacteria are several lengths longer than they should be. They're not too active. They, they forget to divide. They forget, yeah, they said that they forget, they but they have not difficulty. To. They choose not to. Choose. They have okay. difficulty dividing for whatever reason. Could be personal, <laughs> could be you know, unavoidable. And, and this is why, and I just did this the day before yesterday, talking with my dental students, explaining the difference between a defined medium and a complex medium. And LB... Luria broth, whatever we want to call it, is defined as a complex medium because you cannot write a mole fraction of what's in <laughs> LB. Hmm. Nobody knows. It differs from batch to batch. And that's, even, the, even the salt? No, the salt's the one thing. <laughs> so, sodium chloride you can write a yeah. mass balance on. But tryptone, no. no one knows what a tryptone digest of. <laughs> and no one knows what's in yeast extract. And no one's bothered to try and make a defined medium. It's not worth it, right? Well, I mean. No, you can make, make a rich medium. defined medium. In fact, we've started using it because for a lot of our size and growth experiments because we know exactly what's in it. But it's very uh-huh. complicated yeah. media because you have to add all 20 amino acids in the right concentration. You have to add nucleoside. Mm. Yeah, it's not. It's a non. It's not trivial. 
Um, but LB, hmm. people should know the audience, anybody who works with LB, it's actually nitrogen limiting. There's some really nice, uh, Hiroshi Nakaido, hmm. one of my heroes wrote a really nice piece in small things considered like 10, maybe even 15 years ago about. Nitrogen. And it's one of their references. Yeah. And it's one of their references. Exactly. And I'll drop that into the show notes for everyone to go and read her Hiroshi's blog post, because like all things on small things considered, it's small. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't take too long to read and it's written very tightly. So it's a great piece if you're interested about the foibles of LB. Yeah. So I think anyways, <laughs> I mean, LB is, is problematic, but not, you know, as long as you know what you're getting into, it's all good. But uh -huh. um, so they note this and then they kind of think about this magnesium. So what they do is they add a magnesium, but they add a lot. Usually the intracellular concentration of magnesium in E. coli is about 20 to 100 millimolar. They add uh, 10 millimolar outside the cell. So that's actually quite a lot of um, magnesium. And they see that the cells get shorter. And this is uh, actually... Figure one, they just really are showing that the cells are shorter. They have a nice violin plot. They show you their growth curve, log, semi-log. Thank you. Uh, Jen is very good at doing things the right way. So it's nice to see the PI on this. Um, they, where they sampled the cells, also great to see. And they show that the cells are shorter. And their bacillus grows in these chains. It's kind of annoying sometimes if you're doing morphology and cell length. So they stain with a membrane stain. So you can see where the septa are because without that, they just all look long. So they, they, it's a really nice experiment in figure one. And the data is super The images clear. are lovely. Yeah, they're very pretty, very clean images. And you can see they're, they're quite and a bit quantitative shorter. Quantitative data. Yeah, I think they're like 30, 35% shorter when they add the excess magnesium. And again, normally you don't add any magnesium. So this is quite a bit of magnesium. Um, so they see that magnesium makes this big difference in length. And I, I want to say, take a step back and say magnesium is really important. Um, it's a cofactor for ATP hydrolysis enzymes. Um, it's important in lots of other reactions in bacteria like E. bacillus. It actually coordinates the anion, the divalent cation coordinates the anionic polymer lipotechoic acid and helps them maintain their shape in E. coli lipopolysaccharide, it's a different ionic polymer, is also coordinated with magnesium. And there's nice work from the Wong lab that shows that that contributes to rigidity. But so magnesium is really important um, at, in terms of much of the biology and biochemistry that's going on inside bacterial cells, all cells really. So they see that they see this increase. So there are many ways they could see the cells getting shorter, but it, their growth rate, and if you look at this growth curve in figure 1C, it's clear that the mass population doubling time doesn't change. So the cells are getting shorter, but there doesn't seem to be any other problem. They're just dividing when they're shorter. And they try to figure out basically by process of elimination what is going on. And so it's a really nice study that way. Um, they try different media. Is this an LB specific thing? They first use a, another complex medium called CH, which is a little harder to make than LB, but that's typical for bacillus. It's complex uh, in that it has, I think it has case amino acids or casein hydrosylate and some other sort of vague things that bacillus grows in. Um, and they see that it, if they add excess magnesium, it happens there. That's figure two. Um, and normally CH medium has magnesium. If they take magnesium away, the cells get longer. And they saw also that it happens in other bacillus strains, not only their wild type, their wild type strain, which is called 168, but they use PY79, which is just another bacterial strain. Again, these strains have been passaged in labs over years and are, are actually pretty divergent from one another when you do this sequencing. Um, and they look in a wild strain, a strain that hasn't been passaged in labs for quite as long called 3610. And they see they're also magnesium sensitive for size. And that's actually shown really nicely in the figure um, to be. So again, this is pretty high concentrations of extra magnesium, 10 millimolar. They see the same thing works with other divalent cations. So that to me suggests maybe it's a coordination issue, not a enzymatic issue because coordination of anionic polymers with the divalent cation might be more flexible, but that's just my own uh, kind of input there. 
they see it in minimal medium. So it's not LB, it's not only CH, it's not only minimal. So this minimal medium they use is defined. Um, so they know exactly what's in it. Um, and they see the same shortening in the minimal medium. And um, they see the shortening with magnesium again, manganese and zinc. So you know, this happens with all of them. And again, this is quite a bit shorter. 30% is pretty significant. They see if it's dose dependent and they don't see a linear relationship. So they see the largest reduction in size between uh, 0.2 micromolar and 2 millimolar magnesium. But once they go above 2 millimolar magnesium in the media, it, it sort of levels off. They can't get more bang for their buck. They don't get that much shorter after 2 millimolar magnesium. At really high concentrations, magnesium does inhibit growth, which makes sense. I mean, you don't want too much of it around. And uh, so that's shown uh, in, uh, they do it with and without amino acids. I mean, they do it in so many different ways. Uh, It's really quite beautiful. They use a reporter. Very systematic throughout the paper. It's very systematic. And they show you all their work. They're showing you growth curves, which is not standard. And so that's also, I think, super nice. And it's important because... Bacteria like E. coli and B. subtilis, even though they're not related, when they're growing exponentially, they're pretty standard length. But then when they get into stationary phase, they tend to get shorter. So it is actually very important. They're showing you where they sampled from. And the one thing they do in all their growth curves is they give you the doubling time yeah. of the community, which is interesting because then you can wave away the argument that you're just changing the doubling time of the population. And that's the reason behind the changes in length and whatnot. Right. So Michael's getting into actually a somewhat controversial area a little bit. There's this old data. Okay. (laughs) He doesn't even know. No, but there's this old idea that growth rate dictates cell size. If you grow slowly, Mm -hmm. you're shorter. And if you're grow quickly, you're larger. And actually in that paper, which is actually Ilio Schechter, his first author on that paper is Schechter, um, Mola, and uh, Kjellgaard uh, from 1958. Um, in that paper, they actually show though, if you just reduce growth rate by changing, lowering temperature, it's the media. So it's actually what they're growing in that's important, mm-hmm. not how fast they're growing. But they definitely are able, like you said, to again, eliminate growth rate as a contributing factor. As a young graduate student, I was um, inspired by Arthur Koch. Uh, Arthur is very Uh, inspiring. Yes. Arthur, he was on my committee, so I I, I got to suffer many questions with uh, Dr. Koch. (laughs) I just always think of his bubbles and division and Uh turner, and it makes my head feel very sore. (laughs) But yes. um, Here, though, it's very nice. So I think their their next question, they show magnesium, they show it's not strain dependent, it's not medium dependent. In figure five, they ask the question, is the extracellular magnesium impacting intracellular magnesium concentration? Because then if it's impacting intracellular magnesium concentration, the l- reduction in length, the ability of cells to divide when they're shorter might be impacted at inside the cell impacting the part of the division machinery that's on the inside or is it extra cell only the extracellular concentration that matters and they show really nicely that using a reporter that the concentration intracellular concentration doesn't really change and that makes sense because cells have a lot of systems to make sure their cytoplasm is as stable as possible in terms of ph uh, it's a reducing environment that it does homeostasis homeostasis is really important because all those enzymes in there a lot of them are absolutely essential and you can control that environment so you're going to control that environment things on the outside and much of the enzymes for making the cell wall most of them are on the outside those enzymes have no choice they have to deal with whatever is thrown at them because the cell cannot control the extracellular environment bacillus doesn't truly have a paraplasm but even the paraplasm in e coli is open to magnesium flexing in and out and they show though that it's not intracellular so that says it's extracellular magnesium um, they do some work to show it's not through a sensor for magnesium then they look so they look at the ribose switch that controls regulation of magnesium homeostasis. It, it really doesn't see anything. So 
then they take a step back and they look at the cell division machinery and when cells change. And they can see this change within the shortening within 10 minutes of shifting from low to high magnesium. This is really great. It's a beautiful experiment. It's figure six, violin plots. Again, all their work is shown. And it's within 10 minutes and it happens quickly, even in minimal, as well as a semi-complex CH medium. And they can see the shortening. And the last thing they look at really is the cell division machinery. And the way you look at cell division, you can do it in live cells. It's very, it's much harder. They just take snapshots of cells. So they take pictures of cells and they localize the cell division machinery in those cells. And they localize a protein called FTSZ, which is the first protein and it's cytoplasmic to go there. And in cells growing under the conditions that they're growing in, and here they're growing in CH medium, so normally that's like a 40-minute mass doubling time. Most of the cells, a lot of the cells already have FTSE rings, so you know uh, they get a certain frequency of FTSE rings here in the high magnesium. Yeah, I said like 30, 30% have full FTSE rings. When they count a lot of cells, they see a slightly higher number of cells that have FTSE rings that look like they're poised to divide in the high magnesium. So the take-home message is that somehow the high magnesium concentration is communicating probably via the extracellular components of the division machinery that are locked together with FTSE, which is on the intracellular side against the plasma membrane to promote assembly of the division machinery, I think is the easiest interpretation of this. And if you assemble your division machinery better, you don't have to grow as long, you don't have to wait as long to divide, and you'll divide when you're shorter. And that's exactly what they see. Can I just add um, this is painstaking work uh, that they did. So they're looking on average at 800 cells for some of their um, measurements or 300 cells in three independent experiments, each of three independent experiments um, in the microscope doing these measurements. So um, hats off to them for their really methodical approach and their persistence. Yeah, it's very beautiful. And they count enough cells to get significant data. I mean, this difference in FTSC assembly in figure 7F, it's it's kind of subtle, but um, they're set because they break it into classes. So E is just uh, Z rings per micrometer. How basically, if you have, you know, 20 cells, and they're all two microns long, that would be 20 microns worth of cells. And you count the number of rings you see in that. In this F, they're actually breaking it into different classes. Whether you have a full ring, the ring is completely formed. You only have part of the ring. The machinery forms a ring where the cell is going to divide, where you have part. Or you might have no ring, and they actually break it into classes. And that's just more counting and more precision, and they they do it all. And they get significant data, um, especially the none versus um, partial. And again, and that they are only two people. Yeah, they are only two people. Exactly, they are well, only two it's people. Probably the first author. Yeah, I, yes. I don't want to. Yeah, maybe Jen was. <laughs> maybe not. You know, no. you I don't know. want to make any assumptions. Um, but in any case, so hats off to both of them for really pushing it and doing it. Um, I guess the the cool thing about this paper, though, is there are a lot of experiments to do. What is it about magnesium? Mm-hmm. Is it indirect through its interaction with lipotechoic acid and coordination and maltochoic acid, these anionic polymers? Is it through interaction with other components of the cell division machinery? There are transpeptidases and transglycosylases that are devoted to division. Maybe their activity is different. Maybe the machinery just clicks in place better. It's unclear. And so the next, I mean, to me, the next set of experiments would be to do these experiments in uh, figure E7 E and F with other components of the division machinery. And those fusions exist and there are antibodies that exist in bacillus. So I'm really excited to see what they do next because I think they can pinpoint this. And again, it's cool because it says like cell shape is is and cell size in this case or length is really impacted by these things in the environment that fluctuate a lot for bacteria. I mean, this is a soil bacterium. Magnesium concentration is going to be all over the place. Um, And so we should be aware of that. I mean, it also raises the question, is this important or is this just like a side effect of how proteins work? Mm. But I mean, it's really cool. 
and from the general public's perspective of why is this work important is each of these questions opens an opportunity for a new drug target because you know the bacterial cell wall is unique to bacteria we don't have eukaryotes don't have the the n-acetylmuramic acid n-acetyl uh, glucosamine peptidoglycan structure and so all of this you know, really plays into what's actually going on. And if you can begin to impact cell division, um, you can actually have new targets to go after. Yeah, no, the enzymes that build that cross wall, the transpeptidases yes. are targeted by beta-lactam antibiotics. The ones you're familiar with, penicillin, cephalexin, uh, the carbapenem group, those all target the enzymes that are on the outside of the cell that may or may not be sensitive to magnesium. I'm guessing some of them are, and that's why Mm -hmm. we're seeing this difference. So the magnesium concentration in the wound site might change how their sensitivity. I mean, it's super exciting to think about how the environment might impact. And so this kind of, it's cool that they take it from like, we got a new batch of LB, LB. to actually a whole new phenomenon. So it was very exciting. Well, they're lucky that they were looking at the bacteria under the microscope because yeah. if they weren't, they would never have figured it out, right? I, I always say that's right. the dirty secret of bacteriology is that most bacteriologists don't even have good quality microscopes in their lab and they never look at them. And, you know, a lot of things that you can find out about them is if you just took a look under different conditions, you can see this. This is actually pretty, this is much shorter. Mm-hmm. If you look at cells at all, you'll know these are shorter immediately. So. And if we take a step back, it's really impressive how efficient Bacillus subtilis is as you point out, out in the environment, it can't control the local magnesium concentration. So seeing that within 10 minutes, it can make an adjustment and in a way that doesn't affect its overall growth rate. Like it just yeah. keeps humming along. Right, exactly. Like it's not really only impressive. is the machinery sensitive to the divalent cations in the environment, it also, the cell is like, right, the rest of the cell is like, it's fine. It's robust yeah. enough that even though it's dividing when it's 35% shorter, it's still able to replicate and segregate its genome. You would think maybe it would be all smashed in there, but clearly the cells are fine. They grow fine. Their growth curves show that. So hmm. it's very cool. So so in the field, if it encounters different amounts of magnesium, it does this, but presumably that has other consequences as well, right? And that's why this is happening. Well, that's a good question. Um, e. coli actually will get shorter at low pH, But the question is, is that an adaptation or is that just a situation where protein activity is sensitive to the environment? If you ever purify a protein, right, you try to get it to be as active as possible in vitro. But these guys have them on their surface. They can't pick and choose. So is it just a byproduct of the magnesium, whatever enzyme, enzymes it's interacting with just are sensitive to it? It's not an adaptation. It's just you're stuck with having a semi-imperfect system. As long as it's robust, you're okay. Like we say, you just have to look and you'll find new things. Yeah, exactly. You literally just have to look. I recommend (laughs) everybody who works on bacteria, if you work under a certain condition or grow them, just walk down the hall, find somebody with a microscope and ask them to look at your cells. You might see I'm very jealous because you can't do this with viruses. No, but no, yeah, it's true. (laughs) You could Giant at, viruses. You could look at plaque size. That's an, that's an yeah. yeah, you just need to find someone with an electrode microscope. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> All right. Thank you. That's very cool. I like that very much. All right, Michelle, what do you have for us? Yes, I have a paper called Acinetobacter bomani, bomanii, sorry, kills fungi via a type 6 DNA effector. And it was um, work done by Jing Jing Lao, Zhao Shu, Jing Ji. Yu Sun, King Chen Guan, Dan Li, Zhao Jing Lu, and Li Song. And they are at the university in Changchun, China, the first hospital of Jilin University, and also um, an author from Purdue University. And this is also um, hot off the press um, in MBio, a journal from ASM, and it's open access and now um, available online ahead of print. So why should we care about this particular bug? It is a major public health threat. Um, It can cause blood infections, urinary tract infections, pneumonia, 
um, infections of open wounds. And it's an especially a problem in hospitals because it's able to survive on surfaces and it can spread by contact, so on, on hands, for example. So when it, if it contaminates a catheter or a ventilator, it can really create problems for people that are already vulnerable because they're being treated for something in the hospital. Also, a number of the strains have acquired resistance to a number of our antibiotics, including carbapenem, which is a beta-lactam antibiotic that is really important for treating these bugs. So um, there is a lot of interest now in better understanding the biology of Acinetobacter bomani and um, how we might control it. So the CDC um, has labeled it as an urgent threat, and um, it's great that this uh, group is trying to understand um, better its biology. So one of the tricks that it uses to survive in um, low-nutrient environments and compete with com um, other microbes is it has what's called a type 6 secretion system. So this is a um, needle-like or spear-like um, machinery that can translocate bacterial proteins out into the environment or into other cells. And in particular, um, we know from the literature that this bug, Abamani, can kill gram-negative bacteria, it can kill gram-positive bacteria, and even yeast. And so we'll be looking at that mechanism of killing yeast um, today. We also know that this um, machinery, the type 6 secretion sy system, is, is generally held um, quietly by the cell, but it can then be activated so it can be derepressed, and the mechanism of that repression is understood. So it's easy to manipulate um, its activity um, in the lab, and that gave them lots of um, control over their experiments. So the first experiment they do is to um, ask whether Abamani is able to kill other bacteria. And they look in particular at a couple of gram negatives, E. coli and enterobacteria enter, and an enterobacter species. And they also look at the gram positive staph aureus. And in really um, lovely, clear experiments, we're just looking at growth on a plate of cells that have been incubated at a one to one ratio with Abamani and then plated for colony forming units. And you can see quite clearly that um, Abamani is able to kill um, E. coli, Enterobacter, and also Staph aureus. And they provide quantitative data as well. So encouraged by this, they, they do the same experiment, but now they look at three different um, yeast strains. They look at um, our friend Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which we count on for making bread and beer and wine and also doing a wealth of research in the laboratory. But also they look at two different nosocomial fungal pathogens, Candida albicans and Candida galbrata. And again, they see that um, Abamani is able to uh, kill the um, Saccharomyces strains after incubating um, the two, to, or the, the yeast strains after incubating the two microbe species um, together. So they're very interested in understanding how this works. So they um, turn to bioinformatics to look in the genome and look for candidate um, effector proteins that could be secreted by the type 6 secretion system and cause this toxicity. So they come across four gene clusters that have some of the molecular hallmarks of type 6 um, secretion system effectors, and they uh, decide to test each of these candidates. And they do it in a very um, elegant, straightforward manner. They clone each of the four candidates and express them in E. coli behind an inducible promoter. So they can control when E. coli expresses um, each of these candidate toxins, we'll call them. And sure enough, they find that when they induce expression of three of the four loci, they do get um, inhibition of um, bacterial growth of the E. coli. So they're encouraged, and they do the same experiment to look at the um, toxicity toward uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And um, again, they see um, a similar uh, result with one of the four proteins, which they call TAF-E. So when they induce Saccharomyces to express this Abamani protein um, using galactose, then they see um, that the growth of Saccharomyces is inhibited, and there's actually um, cell death. 
So again, they show lovely um, plates with this strong phenotype, and they also um, do quantitative assays and a number of other controls um, to verify that uh, the bacteria are, and the yeast are, are secreting each of the candidate effectors, et cetera. So it's, it's very thorough and convincing. Yeah, I really like these two figures, figure one and two, because you can almost just look at these two figures and understand exactly what they're doing, how they identify it the region and then the effector and just look at their plating results on their dilution yeah. plates are very and and who who wouldn't want to pursue this exactly <laughs> and it's also interesting the way they refer to the acinetobacter as the predator <laughs> yeah well it certainly looks like it in these assays doesn't it uh-huh so um having shown that this um clone gene can confer the cytotoxicity, um, they then want to um, understand how it's working. So again, they go to the bioinformatics, the literature, um, a number of algorithms to look for motifs that, that maybe could give us some predicted functions. And um, fortunately, they do see that the TAF-E gene, this t toxin, has some motifs that are characteristic of nuclease enzymes, enzymes that can digest cut um, DNA. And they um, are emboldened because they even do a phylogenetic analysis and find that many of the other um, Acetobacter um, species do encode this, and even other phyla of um, bacteria encode it. So they think this is worth pursuing. So they're motivated to understand how this um, particular gene is killing different bacterial strains and yeast strains. So they turn to biochemistry. Again, the bioinformatics had predicted that this was a nuclease, and they also it also identified um, a particular amino acids that are in the catalytic domain that had been published to, to be um, critical for um, its function, predicted um, to be important in other uh, nuclease proteins. So they constructed the wild-type gene or genes that had um, mutations in these um, catalytic uh, domains conserved amino acids. And then they um, purified each of those proteins and tested their capacity to degrade DNA in an in vitro assay. And this is shown in figure three. So they've got purified DNA and they um, just incubate it with um, the purified enzyme, either wild type or mutant. And they're very um, thorough in that they not only look at E. coli DNA, they also look at Acetobacter pneumoniae um, DNA, also Saccharomyces cerevisiae DNA, and then um, single-stranded salmon sperm DNA, which some of our listeners might think, why that? But this is an off-the-shelf reagent that we can buy commercially. So it's a standard um, uh, reagent that we can use in experiments when we need a source of pure DNA. And those of us old know that we used to use salmon DNA for uh, blots as, as a sink to t scarf up any of the DNases that may be hanging around in our blotting buffers. Mm. Yeah, lots of uses for it. Mm -hmm. So after incubating their purified DNAs with the um, purified enzyme, either wild type or mutant, then they just um, run that mixture on an agarose gel and stain with thidium bromide. So again, a really classic, simple molecular biology assay. And you can see quite clearly that, yes, the wild type um, a toxin gene does degrade the DNA, and it doesn't care whose DNA you give it, it will degrade it. And it requires each of those conserved amino acids in the catalytic domain to do so. So they're confident now that they've got a DNase, <clears throat> but they push it one bit further. It's well known that DNases require magnesium. <laughs> so they demonstrate uh, that this enzyme does as well. So it, they do the same um, degradation assay in the presence or absence of a chelator EDTA, presence or absence of supplemental magnesium or calcium, and they show quite convincingly that this is a magnesium-dependent DNAs. Yes, this is cool because they show it's specifically magnesium, not any divalent cation. We'll do it. Yeah, they're very careful. But we still have a conundrum here because um, we know that the type 6 secretion system is able to deliver this um, protein into bacterial cells, but it's also um, supposedly degrading the DNA of yeast, which, are, of course, are eukaryotes. And they've got a membrane um, between their 
outer membrane and their chromosomes. So how is this toxin getting across the nuclear membrane, or is it? So to ask that question, again, they do a very straightforward experiment. They engineer a yeast strain that is expressing this nuclease toxin fused to green fluorescent protein. And then, as we talked about in the snippet, they look in the microscope. Mm. And sure enough, um, when they stain the cell's DNA with um, DAPI, which fluoresces blue, and then look at the GFP that's linked to the toxin, they see um, beautiful overlap between the two. However, if they do the same experiment, and instead of using yeast as the host cell, they use a mammalian eukaryotic cell, in this case, HeLa cells, um, the enzyme toxin does not get into the nucleus, nor does it kill the HeLa cells. So they can conclude then that this is a DNA, it's able to get into the nucleus and attack the DNA of yeast cells, but it's yeast specific. It's not true of mammalian cells, or at least the one that they looked at. So they were also curious at this point to um, ask, um, how widespread is this particular toxin in the um, Bamanii strains? And at their hospital, they had a large collection, 78 different clinical isolates um, that had been um, obtained from patients. And they used um, polymerase chain reaction to ask how many of them encode this TAFA toxin. And we're probably a bit surprised only three of them have acquired this um, particular DNA. So that's something to bear in mind. So the next experiment, the, really the final one, is to get at the paradox. Um, here they've demonstrated that this is a potent uh, DNA and that it in vitro can degrade even the DNA from its host, Bamani, B- Bamanii. <laughs> so how is it that the live um, Acetobacter Bamanii are not um, vulnerable to this um, toxin. So here again, the literature um, is a terrific guide and it generates a testable hypothesis. Um, We know that many different microbes encode bacterial toxins that also encode an antitoxin or an immunity protein that protects the cell that's generating the toxin from its activity and then injects that toxin into other cells that don't have the immunity protein. And fortunately, our efficient bacteria often um, express this or encode the antitoxin or immunity protein um, just downstream or linked to the toxin itself. So again, they use bioinformatics. They go in and look at the DNA of their strain. And sure enough, there's a candidate um, open reading frame sitting right next to the toxin that they wisely decide to test. Could this be the immunity protein? And I should point out that that toxin that immunity protein will not be exported via the type 6 secretion system. It will remain inside the acinetobacter, effectively protecting its DNA. Because it doesn't have the signaling sequences that would link it to the type 6. Yep. Yes. So very um, elegant, efficient mechanism. So they next want to ask, is this a bona fide um, immunity protein? And so again, they go to um, their um, E. coli strain, I believe. And they do this actually both in E. coli and in Saccharomyces. So two of the, um, of the prey species, we'll call them. And they find that when the, either the yeast or the E. coli express both the toxin and the adjacent immunity um, protein, then the cell lives, the microbe lives Whereas if they only um, express the toxin, of course, um, they die. And we know from their other experiments that their DNA is getting degraded. And they also did some genetic experiments to demonstrate that it was, in fact, the nuclease activity um, that was responsible for all of this. So to summarize, they showed that um, Acetobacter baumannii is really a tough survivor. It's a dangerous pathogen, and it's equipped to kill Gram negatives, gram positives, and fungi. Some of the strains are able to do so because they make this toxin antitoxin system that protects their own cell, but they use the type 6 
um, secretion system, the sphere or the needle, to inject the toxin into other cells. And that toxin actually encodes a um, nuclear localization signal that can get it into the me- um, across the nuclear membrane of even yeast. And there, um, the nuclease activity can then attack the um, chromosomal DNA and degrade it and kill their competitors. So they think in the environment that this system likely increases the fitness of Bamanii by eliminating competitors and also liberating nutrients that they can then use um, to support the growth of their own strain. And they also recognize that this is kind of exciting because they showed that if they eliminate the immunity protein, then the Bamanii strain are susceptible to killing by the nuclease. So they reasoned that if they could come up with a small molecule inhibitor of the immunity protein, it could then make the um, Bamanii strain um, commit suicide, essentially, by um, this TAF-E nuclease. Of course, a limitation that they point out of that of that approach is that, at least in their collection, um, a minority of their clinical isolates actually had this toxin antitoxin system. But um, it's certainly something that could be screened for and then um, apply that um, potential um, therapeutic as a way to kill um, the Bamanii in a wound infection or other nasty infection. So I was really impressed with Mm -hmm. um, the logic that they used and how they applied really um, straightforward molecular biology techniques and microbiological assays and biochemical assays to uncover this um, really powerful system that equips this nasty um, hospital pathogen to kill a variety of microbes, gram-negative, gram-positive bacteria, and also uh, fungi. Yeah, it's very interesting. And also a reminder that acinetobacter is a, um, it's like an opportunistic environmental microbe. It's not I mean, it's not using this. It doesn't actually do anything to the mammalian cells. This isn't part of its virulence. It's part of its ability to survive in the environment, probably. And that reminds us of the old adage, the goal of every microbe is to make two microbes. Exactly. It doesn't care about It's not to cause (laughs) nasty infections, right? It just does what it needs to do to get the nutrients it needs to make two and then four and then eight microbes. (laughs) Who said that? Did, Did Stan Falco say that? I the goal of every microbe is to make. Them. I feel like there's a quote. Maybe it's from Mano that yeah, the maybe dream of Manoa, every yeah. microbe is to be two That's microbes. Right. Yeah, I might Very have gotten cool. that wrong, readers, uh, listeners. Maybe you can uh, correct us. Yeah. So I, I'll point out this is. Um, I think this would be a great teaching paper um, in that it's a really well controlled and it teaches mm-hmm. us a number of the principles um, that are common in the biological yeah. world and also introduces important microbial ecology pr- principles. I think the other paper is a good teacher too, right? I, I think so. I think it's more, um, it's a nice actually introduction to microbiology paper growth and looking and measuring cells. Yeah. I think this one, actually I was thinking I have uh, I'm teaching starting next week, and I have a section on either I could use it for secretion or for pathogenesis. It's quite nice. In that, yeah. seems like the, the the magnesium paper also you could actually do in a lab. Actually, yeah, I think it'd right? make a great lab paper because it's easy enough. You just need a good microscope, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and a culture of bacillus. <laughs> yeah, some, those are easy. And, uh, those are easy. Some yes, uh, some sigma LB. <laughs> you just add your own magnesium. That's very cool. Two very cool papers. Um, I'm going to read a couple of email here that just came in. First one is from Catherine. I recently came across your podcast on Spotify and love them. As a young researcher, I find it valuable to listen in on conversations between experts in my field, and I haven't been able to find that anywhere else. Good luck. We're pretty unique here among our all our podcasts. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you. I have a question you may or may not be able to help out with. I have been growing Fecalibacterium prausnitzi successfully in eight milliliter tubes, and they on average reach an OD600 of about 1.6. But when I inoculate this culture into a bigger volume of liquid, I've tested 80 milliliters and 800, it doesn't grow as well. We inoculate when they're at their mid-exponential phase. They never grow to an OD above one. Interestingly enough, we've inoculated a single colony into a 500 mil and a centrifuge cell pellet into an 80 mil, and these have grown well. We did this because we began to hypothesize that they were releasing something that was inhibiting their own growth 
So we remove the supernatant to reduce a carryover effect. Have you ever seen something like this? And is there any explanation you might have <laughs> as to why a liquid to liquid inoculation isn't working for this strain? Thanks for your podcast. Hoping to hear from you. <laughs> okay, anybody? <laughs> this is a fascinating observation. It and you know this bacterium for our our lay listeners out there and, and for me i haven't yeah, heard I of haven't it, heard of it, <laughs> it it lives in the demilitarized zone in our small intestine and it actually controls that dynamic of letting bacteria into our sterile body tissue so it it's it's the border guard if you will of our dmz so it's it's very very important so what her observation sounds to me like is it could be in these high densities, it may be producing a quorum factor that is actually being carried over that tells them, hey, stop growing uh, because you've reached saturation. And uh, when they dilute it, liquid, liquid, that there's still a significant concentration of quorum factors, which is why the dilution uh, of the quorum factor likely works. Or it could be gas exchange when you're growing it in large volumes because this is a strict anaerobe. So you're typically growing it in an atmosphere that may have 5% hydrogen, which some of the microbes may be using. And this particular bacterium is extremely important for our gut health because it um, controls the amount of butyrate in our uh, small intestine, which is important for the overall health of our colonocytes and our endothelial layer as well, and the microbial community to control its base diversity, effectively controlling that uh, the microbes in the DMZ, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. And also in the Bacillus paper from today, we, the authors cite a post by Hiroshi Nakato from Elio's blog, and, and uh, I'll put that blog post in it. You, you may find it intriguing if you're new to the podcast. You may not have heard uh, our previous references to this great blog post on, on LB. But when you figure this out, let us know. Mm. We'd love to learn more about this. And what I love is that it, it's another example of an experimentalist just noticing something odd that doesn't make sense. It's not what they expect. And um, they've done some experiments to try to begin to understand the mechanism. I, I'd love, Catherine, if you would do a, one more experiment, which is, um, you, so you have already removed the supernatant to reduce the carryover effect. How about now taking that supernatant mm. and mixing it with cells of different numbers and then putting that into the the fresh um, volume of media and seeing if, in fact, the um, supernatant does have an inhibitory effect. Right. That's a classic uh, spent medium. Mm -hmm. It's called spent medium experiment. Yeah. That is a great idea. So take your old medium, filter out all the cells, and then see if cells grow, essentially swap cells like you do in your single colony experiment in the third paragraph of your email here. That's a great. And, and in the olden days, we would suggest dialysis to being of various pore sizes <laughs> to figure yep. out the size. Well, well, if the spent medium inhibits, then that's the next step. Right? Yeah, then, the then the next experiment. Inhibit, then uh, I'm not sure where yeah. we're at. But. Right. Good luck, Catherine. Cool. Very good. All right. Kaz writes, I appreciate what you are doing. I'm a driver and you all keep me informed and company throughout my long cross-country drives. I hope to go to college someday and get my degree. Best to you all. Kaz. So I think that's cool. Thank that you. Kaz is listening in from the, from the truck or the drive, whatever he or she is driving. Thanks, Kaz. I too listen to postdocs when I have a lot or podcasts when I have a long drive. And finally, from Pete, this one is for you guys, I think, a new super group. So this is an article in Nature. Microbial predators form a new super group of eukaryotes. This is right up Mark Martin's <laughs> Avenue. I was thinking uh, of this. Ten I, I, I sent him the paper this afternoon when I saw yeah. this note. And I said, you probably missed this in your rush to finish final exams at the end of the year because it was published on the 7th of December in 22. Uh -huh. So he may be behind in his nature reading. 
10 previously undescribed strains of microbial predators isolated through culture that collectively form a diverse new supergroup termed Provora. It is genetically, morphologically, and behaviorally distinct from other eukaryotes and comprises two divergent clades of predators that are superficially similar but differ fundamentally in ultrastructure behavior and gene content. They are in marine and freshwater environments, but rare and have been overlooked. All right. Um, I don't know anything about this. <laughs> and, and Pete's from Sydney, Australia. He is. Pete is a, is a listener. He's often on our live streams. And, and he's, um, he's, he's asked um, who's the person that is um, doing the tree, best tree of life work with microbes. Know. Does anybody know? Um. <laughs> I don't know. It was the yeah, guy that Norm Pace. Well, it was Norm Pace was doing it for a long time, but right. I haven't been following it I of think late. Somebody who does some systematic, so like Esther Ongard at Cornell University, who worked with Norm mm-hmm. Pace actually as a grad student. You know, she does some people who identify new organisms and place them. Mm-hmm. I don't know how that's done now so much because it's now become, you know. Because of people like Norm Pace and yeah. before him Carl Woese, or with Carl Woese, uh, you know, this you send sequence in and it gets <laughs> put into the, the tree of life. So I don't know who actually yeah. makes the decision that it's a new group or not. Or not, yes. So, so Pete also said, who's the taxonomy guy you know? Well, that's Jens Kuhn, who really is a virologist. He's, in, he, he's on the ICTV, the International Committee for the Taxonomy of Viruses. And, is involved in classifying viruses there, but I don't, I don't know that he would know much about this. But, but maybe you could probably Mark, direct him to someone if you could provide that name in the show notes. Maybe Mark Martin will have some insight. Yeah, true. Uh, Mark Martin or um, Jack Gilbert at San Diego um, has been doing a lot of work on, and in Michelle's neighborhood, we got Tom Schmidt and Pat Schloss. Hmm who do a lot of, um, more so Tom than, than Pat, I would think. What about Rob Knight? Rob Knight as well, yes. Okay. All right. Maybe if uh, Mark gets excited about it, he can come back on and talk about <laughs> it. Yes. Thank you, Pete. That'll do it for TWIM 280. So this year we're going to hit 300, right? You bet. We hope. That's a nice number. This year we're going to do something... Uh, at Q or something like that, right? That's the Yes. Point. That should be fun. All right. Show notes are at microbe.tv slash twim. You can send your questions, comments to twim at microbe.tv. If you like our work, we would love your financial support. You go to microbe.tv slash contribute. There are a lot of ways you can do that. Uh, you can find Patreon and PayPal. You can mail us a check. I get checks every day here. It's really fun <laughs> to see people. And they send little notes with their checks. You know, it's a lot of fun. And um, there's another way that's very interesting. It's called Amazon Smile. Mm-hmm. And this is if you buy from Amazon, what you do is you go to smile.amazon.com and you pick Microbe TV as your designated charity. And then a fraction of your purchases get sent to us automatically. You don't pay anything more for your purchase. You don't get paid. You don't pay anything less either. <laughs> but a little fraction. And we've got so far like $750 have come in uh, from people buying. But many, if, obviously, if many more people did this, and many other people designate other charities that are very worthwhile. But uh, if you like microbiology, microbe.tv slash contribute. Michelle Swanson, University of Michigan. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Michael Schmidt, Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everyone. And and no one knows this because there's no video, but Michael's office is clean. Look at that. <laughs> it's shiny. It's you guys notice? Spotless. The tape well, the papers are, are gone. Shiny. I saw a pair of glasses behind him, but other than that. Yes. And yeah, other than the glasses. That way I don't lose them. Petra Levin is at Washington University in St. Louis. Thanks, Petra. Thank you. And I am Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM and Ronald Jenkins for the music. So I think it's cool that, you know, years ago, Barbara Hyde okayed us, and we're still going. You we're bet. still going. <laughs> this episode of TWIM was edited by Ray Ortega. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. Microbiology.